Okay. Well, we are continuing with the parables of Christ, and we are going to be talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn open to that. And we will begin our conversation here in just a moment. Let's, uh, let's remind ourselves where we are at. We need to remember that Jesus is teaching this par these parables uh, to the crowds. And then he explains this one to the disciples, according to verse 36 of Matthew 13. And that's, that's important to know. Uh, he's trying to communicate uh, spiritual truth. Remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meeting. And he is not only preparing the disciples through these truths, but he's also communicating in a very creative and uh, clear way to those who are listening to him, the crowds, uh, in such a way that was unlike like the scribes and the Pharisees. We also need to remember the previous setting or the previous parable that we looked at last week of the sower and the seed. And I believe there's a connection here. We're going to be talking about wheat and tares. And we're going to be talking about a sowing process of good seed and someone coming in and sowing uh, weeds or tares among them. Remember, the parable of the sower and the seed describe the four different conditions of the human heart. The hard soil, and then we have the shallow soil, which is the emotional response to the gospel. Then we have the thorny sto soil, which is the person, as Jesus himself said, uh, considers uh, the claims of the world. They are preoccupied with the worries of the world. And those three soils are uh, conditions of the heart that do not produce genuine salvation. Now, that's important for you to hang on to because the parable of the wheat and the tares build off of that to a certain extent. And, of course, the good soil is that which bears fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, these are back-to-back -back instructions. That kind of hit me as I was preparing for this. There's no time lag. There's not 24 hours that has gone by. This is not a uh, weekly uh, uh, instruction at the temple. Uh, it is back to back to back that he is ministering to with these parables, at least in Matthew 13. And then this is the first of the kingdom parables because verse 24 says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to. <clears throat> and when we did the introduction, I think I mentioned to you that there are seven kingdom parables, and this is the first of them. And then I want to also remind us when he talks about uh, the kingdom of heaven, this is uh, analysis, uh, allegorial, whatever the word is, this is parallel to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because the Sermon on the Mount is specifically given to the disciples, and it is a sermon that prepares the disciples to thoroughly understand what a kingdom saint should look like. And so we are going to see several things intertwine with each other as we go through this parable. Now, Jesus tells the parable. A man is sowing good seed, verse 24. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. It says in verse 25, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So the servants have fallen asleep. Um, it's unclear whether they were part of the sowing process. I think if they were, the Spirit of God would have included them in verse 24. 
I think they were more assigned to guarding the field from this very thing that takes place in the parable. But they fell asleep, kind of like the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus was arrested. And the enemy comes in and sows tares. So just like the man who sowed good seed, remember, broadcasting, scattering it, here comes this man, unobserved because the servants have fallen asleep, and he's scattering, he's broadcasting the tares, seeds that are wheat, excuse me, seeds that are weeds that will grow up simultaneously with the wheat, and if left unattended, could choke it out. And of course, this would be similar to the third soil that we talked about last week. And the servants question the man who sowed the good seed. He sa It says in verse uh, 27, the save slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have tares? Almost seems like they're blaming the man that uh, somehow the tares got mixed up with the good seed, and he should have noticed it. But the options are discussed. The servants say, or he says, an enemy, verse 28, has done this. And the slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? In other words, do you want us to try to separate them out now? And the man says in verse 29, no. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the weed with uh, the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barns. So the options are discussed and then the option is selected. We're going to let them grow up together, and when it comes down to harvest time, we will carefully separate the tares from the wheat, and the first goal is to, uh, in the separation process, bind up the tares so we can burn them uh, so they will not spread or scatter or be blown around by the wind and fall into somebody else's property. So. This is the parable that he tells. Now, in verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares and the wheat. Well, first of all, here's a picture of what wheat looks like and the tares look like. And although these pictures separate them, if you mix them in together in a field, um, it might be very, very difficult to spot initially. But as the wheat grows up and the tares grow up, it becomes very evident what is the good seed and what is the bad seed. So Jesus explains the parable. He says in verse 37, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man the son of man is another reference for jesus um, he is the sower and then he says in verse 38 the field is the world so the son of man is sowing good seed in the world the greek word here is cosmos and it means world in general, and if we are talking about the world in general terms, then we are talking about the inhabitants as well uh, in the world. And then he said the good seeds, verse 38, uh, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. These are the sons of the kingdom. So these are genuine uh, Born again, kingdom citizens, these are the good soil. These are men and women who are the good seed. 
And we'll explain how that works out here in a minute. I want you to understand here that the sons of the kingdom are is not the focus of sowing the good seed. It's the sower who is sowing the good seed. So the sower is going to use the sons of the kingdom and place them in the world according to his will and purpose. The tares, according to this parable, are the sons of the evil one, verse 38. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. These are people who are not believers. These could represent the first three soils from the parable of the sower and the seed. Uh, the sons of the evil one, uh, some of their hearts might be very hard and calloused. Uh, some might have had an emotional response to the good news that was given to them. But because of persecution, because of difficulties, because of other things, they fall away. And then remember that the rocky soil, uh, or excuse, yeah, the rocky, the thorny soil uh, are those who hear, but then they are uh, occupied with the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. These are the tares. These are the sons of the evil one. And they mix in with the sons of the kingdom. And there is going to be a spiritual conflict. Now, the parable doesn't say that, but if you compare the rest of Scripture, there is a uh, battle between light and darkness, between good and evil, between righteousness and unrighteousness. And then he says, the enemy who sold them is the devil. Now, the devil is Satan, uh, the serpent of old. Uh, this is one of his names, deceiver, which would fit in very well with sowing of the tares among the good seed that was planted. Now, stop and consider this for a moment. The devil is guiding and directing and motivating and controlling the sons of the evil one. He directs their pathway, just like hopefully the Holy Spirit directs the sons of the kingdom, the good seed, in what we should be doing. And Ephesians talks about this very clearly, that prior to our salvation, we walked according to the course of this world. We were uh, dominated by the evil one. And so this is the source for the sons of the evil one. They take their cue, directions, their thought patterns, their feelings come from the hub, if you please, of the devil. Then the harvest, according to this parable, is the end of the age. So we are talking about eschatology here. We are talking about things that will happen after the rapture, uh, there will be a uh, separation uh, after the tribulation. And we'll look at that a little bit later on. But we're, we're talking after our, our lifetime, if you please. We're talking, about, we're talking after the age of the church. And so when the church has been removed, the beginning of the end of the age starts. The tribulation cannot start until the church has been removed, until the church has been raptured. And then, interestingly here, you and I are not going to be in the process of separating the wheat from the tares. It's going to be the angels that will do this in verse 40. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, shall it be at the end of the age, verse 39. And the reapers are the angels. Verse 41 says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, 
and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And of course, we've seen that phrase repeatedly. So the furnace of fire, this is the judgment on lawlessness, lawless ones and stumbling blocks. But I want you to notice in verse 21, uh, verse 41, the son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom. Did you get that? Gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. Now, if you remember back on our series of heaven, on heaven, we talked about, I'm sorry, we talked about uh, some of the events that had to take place uh, before entrance into heaven. And one of the things that we talked about, I believe, uh, we talked about uh, the millennial kingdom. We went through the tribulation. We took a look at the first half of the tribulation, and you had two judgments there. The second half of the tribulation, we had one final judgment, and then there was a uh, uh, an event that took place. And there is a judgment in Matthew chapter 25. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, of the separation of the sheep and the goats, of the sheep and the goats. Because if you remember, I hopefully supported from Scripture that only the righteous, and here it is supported again in verse 43, only the righteous enter into the millennial kingdom. That is the earthly kingdom that Christ's establishes when he comes from heaven and comes down to earth he will rule on earth for 1000 years that's where you get the word millennium but prior to starting the millennium no lawless one or stumbling blocks can get into the kingdom only the righteous will come into the kingdom so did that did that mean righteous in their spiritual bodies or righteous in their physical bodies. Well, it's going to be men and women, Jew and Gentile, and from all other different nations who believe the message of the two great witnesses and the 144,000, those who have believed, those who have refused to accept the mark of the beast, 666, and who survived and are living when Christ comes back, those are the ones that will enter into the kingdom. But there is a separation that takes place first, and that's the separation of the sheep and the goats. Now, the main point, I believe, of this parable is that not everyone who professes or confesses Christ as Savior and Lord are possessors and their true identity, not truth, their true identity will be exposed and judged by God. I really believe this is what the parable is talking about. It's not talking about how the kingdom expands and how it grows. That's going to be parables that follow after this, like the mustard seed and what have you. This is building on top of the Four different types of soil. And Jesus is preparing his disciples who will go out two by two on two separate occasions. And he is showing them you let, need to look for the true identity. Just because they profess, oh, I believe in Jesus, I believe he's the Son of God, so forth and so on. And just because they confess, does not make them a possessor of a personal reality. It's either an intellectual possession. It's either an emotional confession. They do not possess it. They have not made it their own by faith and repentance. Now, it's going to be hard to tell 
it's going to be hard to tell. God is the one who will ultimately examine their true identity and expose them and judge them. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says this, and let's back up for a little bit here. Let's go back to verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Now stop for a moment. Jesus is saying, look, there's going to be a bunch of people out there that look like sheep. But they are ravenous wolves. That's what he says. And how will we know this, Jesus? By their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. Now watch how, how specific and clear-cut Jesus gets. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? You don't go to an orange tree and look for apples. You don't go to an apple tree and look for oranges. What is, what is Jesus saying here? The nature communicates the fruit or reverse it. The, evan, the, uh, the lifestyle of a person communicates the fruit or the root in their life. In fact, he says in verse 17, So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, we need to put this in the Greek language, which is continuous tense. So every good tree continually bears good fruit, but the bad tree continually bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot habitually produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree habitually produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's kind of like the tares, right? So then you will know them by their fruits. How clear can we get as an application to this parable here? You will know them by their fruits. Rick, do we have a right to judge? Jesus says yes. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, if you go back, and a lot of people misunderstand this verse in my opinion, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measurement, it will be measured to you. What is Jesus saying here? I don't believe this. these two verses of Matthew chapter 7 are a prohibition not to judge. It is a caution about how you judge. How you judge. If you are harsh and critical in your judgment, don't expect to receive anything different when it comes your turn. If you are loving and gracious and a truth seeker, expect that when it comes to be your turn. This, these verses don't say don't judge. If that's the case, then these two verses are in contradiction to other verses that tell us to what? Church discipline. That tells us to exhort one another, admonish one another, rebuke one another. The scriptures cannot be in conflict with one another, guys. So it's a caution about how we judge. We are to be fruit inspectors. But the final judgment, the final judgment is left to God. That's what Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who professes Lord, Lord, not everybody who confesses Lord, Lord is going to get into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So the person who strives to do the will of God recognize when they are on a slippery slope, come to understand what I'm doing is an abomination to the holiness of God. And if you please, in sackcloth and ashes, repents and stands up and goes opposite way from the sinful pathway. 
that person is doing the will of God. You know what comes to my mind right now? Remember the epithet that uh, I believe it was the Apostle Paul in, uh, I think, uh, Acts 13, that he uses David. And he says that David was a man after God's own heart. And you know, you hear that by preachers. You hear that by teachers exhorting us to be a man after God's own heart. Take a look at David. He was a man after God's own heart. Well, you better turn the coin a little bit and take a look at the other side of beloved David's life. David was an adulterer. David was a murderer. David was a poor father. David disobeyed God's command about not numbering the people. What made him a man after God's own heart? Well, if you read the rest of that verse in Acts, David was a man after God's own heart because he did all of the will of God. There it is, beloved. There it is. Look, a Christian has a internal battle with the old nature that has not been evicted. The old nature does not get evicted until the rapture or you die. Then it's evicted. But until then, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I've got this conflict inside of me. The things that I don't want to do, hey, yeah, yeah, I wind up doing. And the things I should do, hey, yeah, yeah, I don't do. But Paul understood the battle. But it's the repentance, it's the return to the will of God that makes me a possessor. People who possess a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will receive the rebuke and the correction of the Holy Spirit and look at themselves in the mirror of God's word and say, God, I have sinned against you. They should have a Peter experience. Lord, depart from me. I'm a wicked man that lives among a corrupt people. When that takes place, you have a possessor. So this is important, but understanding that the final exposure and judgment will be by God. Now let me throw a parenthesis in here. Matthew 18 is in the Bible for a purpose. Matthew 18 is the church discipline passage. It instructs the church on how to confront sin. Um, Paul exercised church discipline on the immoral man, even by absentee ballot, if you please, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 7 or 5, 1 Corinthians 5. He exercised church discipline because the church was, was arrogantly proud that they were so progressive to allow this sexual immorality take place that Paul says even the Romans and the Greeks don't tolerate this kind of nonsense. And so as we have been going through on the mornings in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the marks of godly sorrow, Paul's letter produced that. He really didn't want to write that letter. If you go read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, 8 and 9. Paul really struggled to write this letter. And he had to realize, I have to do what is spiritually and morally right. He didn't want to be attacked anymore. He didn't want to be criticized anymore because he had been. And he says, look, I've got to, I've got to do the right thing. And he does. And they responded, they repented, and guess what? It says in verse 10 and 11, what tremendous joy he had to see their complete repentance. And then 
He says, look at the benefit it has produced in you, Corinthians. And then he gives six marks of godly sorrow that we are starting to unfold. So the main point here is not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is a believer. And Jesus put it very clearly. You will know them by their fruits. Now, let's do some reminders here for the 21st century. How do we apply it to ourselves today? First of all, after we sow the good seeds, good seed. Remember, we are, we are the ones who sow the seed. We are the, uh, the children of the good seed, if you please. After we sow the good seed, have we fallen asleep? Are we like those slaves who fell asleep? That they weren't guarding their master's plot of land? And any vagabond could come along and do what they did? God expects us to guard and protect the wheat. Guard and protect the seed. Acts chapter 20, verse 31 says this. Therefore, be on the alert. Paul is talking to the elders at, from Ephesus at Miletus. And he's given them one last series of instructions because he's going to be arrested and taken to Rome. Verse 31. Therefore, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, look, I've given you an example of what it means to be alert. Night and day, I was ministering to the city of Ephesus. And we saw some marvelous miracles. In fact, sorcery had almost been put to death because of the power of Christ. They came, and the scripture says they continually were coming and burning their books. But he says, look, you elders here, I'm God's moving me on. You're in charge here. Be alert. And then Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, he writes these words. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Back up to verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. We need to be alert and sober. We need to be aware of the spiritual things that are going on around us. And if we want to get practical, we need to be aware of the spiritual temperature of Moxie Community Church. First Peter 5, 8 says this, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Now, that is a, a statement of, of uh, I don't want to say condition. It's a logical statement, okay? Be of sober. If you are sober, you'll be on the alert. Now, sober is not referring to refraining from alcoholic beverages or drug-inducing hallucinatories. Sober means to be vigilant, to be aware of your surroundings. It's like a soldier on guard duty. Even though it's 2 o'clock in the morning and it's dark, and appears to be quiet. Nothing seems to be going on in the DMZ zone in front of him. He still has to be alert because the enemy is crafty. The enemy can come sneaking up. He could doze off for a minute that would jeopardize not only his life, but perhaps the life of those on the compound. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. See, while we are sleeping, and I hope we're not, the enemy is wide awake. Just like 
Satan was roaming around and he went up to heaven. God says, where you been? Well, I've been trying to find somebody I could trip up. And of course, you have the whole story of Job at that particular point. After we sow the good seed, have we fallen asleep? God expects us to guard and protect. Second of all, do we recognize the professors and the confessors from the, from the possessors? And I think these are kind of key words here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 says this. I'll get my pages turned right here. Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. And we're not going to get into this too deeply because I've touched on it once or twice before one sermon in some detail about the current situation with the prosperity preachers. We need to recognize the professors from the confessor and the confessors from the possessors. And if you, if you can't keep that straight in your mind, just remember this verse from Matthew chapter 7. By their fruits, you will know them. If there is no evidence of a life that has changed, you can go to the bank. There's no root that has taken place. If we say someone got saved and for the next four, five, six years, they just lived a life of wantonness, of sexual immorality, of drug addiction, of embezzlement, whatever it might be. They just lead a, a sinful life. And yet you led them to the Lord, supposedly, or they shared with you that Pastor Rick led them to the Lord. But you don't see any fruit coming from their lives. So we only have one conclusion that we can come to, right? Number one, either you or I did not present an unvarnished gospel message. We, we made a weak presentation of the gospel. That's one reason. Second of all, the person was not genuinely committed to the message that we proclaimed. They were a professor. They were a confessor. And so again, by their fruit that we are going to know them. Listen. If you give a clear message of the gospel, and it's real simple, if you would just memorize 1 Corinthians 15, that God entrusted to Paul, first and foremost of all, in his entire ministry, Paul says, this is the most important thing that God entrusted me, that Christ was born of a virgin according to the scriptures, Christ lived his life, Christ died according to the scriptures, was raised on the third day for our justification. If you will get those three points down and be able to articulate them simply, maybe incorporating one or two examples, you will present an unvarnished gospel. And if you do that and the person prays with you and then there's no change in their life, it's not the message fault. And it's not the messenger's fault. It's the person. It's the person that we have presented the gospel to. The Son of Man places each of us, remember we're the sons of the kingdom, in the right field at the right time. Remember when we read this briefly back in Matthew 13? Jesus explains this where he says this. That the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. So the son of man is the one sowing 
the good sowing the seed, the sons of the kingdom, that's us. And the field is the world. Now, have you ever stopped to think if this conclusion is correct, that Christ puts us, directs our pathway through circumstances, through counsel, whatever it might be, directs us to the right field or the right location at the right time. It's all his doing. And sometimes it's a little bit rocky. It's a little bit rough. Remember poor Isaiah. God said, who's going to go for me? And Isaiah volunteered. And then he asked, how long, Lord, and how many? God says, all of your life and nobody. Isaiah was in the right spot at the right time. You see, when God puts us in the right location at the right time, all we have to do is be faithful. We are not responsible for the results. I hope you got that. I need to get that oftentimes. I am not responsible for the results. I'm responsible to be a fat Christian. Now, some of you can stop laughing right now, okay? Fat. It's, a, it's an acronym. F-A-T. Faithful. Available. Teachable. That's all that God wants from us. Faithful, available, and teachable. You also need to be reminded of what the Apostle Paul said. That we might plant the seed. We might share the gospel. And seemingly see nothing. Somebody else comes along and waters it. Somebody else comes along and challenges the emotional and, and mental incorrectness about something and pull tears out. And then someone comes along and reaps the harvest. I wonder how many people in my life were used before I came to know the Lord as my personal Savior. That's the idea here. And then last of all, the final judgment belongs to God. The final judgment belongs to God. And Matthew 25, 31 to 46, uh, we have not looked at that, but let's take a look at it very quickly, okay? Matthew 25, 31 to 46, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another uh, as the sheep separates, as the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. This is before the millennial. This is after the tribulation. There is a, another judgment, if you please, that a lot of people don't talk about. And it's the time sheep are going to be righteous, goats are going to be unrighteous. So he says in verse 31, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. So Come on, enter into the millennium. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Now notice the word righteous here. Not saved. Because when the church is out of here, we go back to the Old Testament understanding of people who are righteous because they believe the word of God and people who are unrighteous because they reject the word of God. So he's talking about those people who have come through the tribulation. And as I said earlier, they believed the message of the two great witnesses and the 144,000. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in uh, or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now watch this. Then the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. What is he saying? That these righteous people who lived through the tribulation 
ministered to others as they as if they were ministering to Christ. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for you and the devil and his angels. I thought that didn't take place until the great white throne judgment. No. During this separation, those goats are going to be forever placed in eternal damnation. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked. You did not clothe me sick and in prison. You did not come and visit me. Then they themselves also answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison did not take care of you? Then he answered them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there is a judgment, and though we might not be able to clearly discern those saved from the unsaved, God ultimately will bring his truthful eye to bear on the character and the practice and execute judgment accordingly. The only way that we might be able to discern someone, whether being saved or unsaved, is by their fruit. That's what Jesus said. By their fruit, you will know them. Next time we get together, we are going to talk about the parable of the mustard seed. It's only a couple of verses long, but uh, there are some encouragement there as well. Okay, let's see here. All right, come on. Okay, why are you doing this? <laughs> 